Back in here just before 7.40 on a Friday edition, and my pleasure to welcome in. He is one of our local state house representatives from here in Albany County, uh, recently elected the minority whip for the upcoming 2019 legislative session that starts on Tuesday. Charles Pelkey in studio with me this morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. I appreciate the time here before. Uh, I know that you serve on the Judiciary Committee as well as a couple other committees, so I kind of want to start there and then we'll kind of broaden the scope. Uh, first of all, judiciary-wise, anything big coming up as you look at this upcoming legislative session that you guys have been talking about in particular with the Judiciary Committee, Charles? Well, in the interim, we've been working on uh, both analyzing and trying to solve some of the problems that we have with criminal justice reform. Um, we had a recent Council of State Governments study show us the numbers. We actually have declining crime rates in Wyoming, but we have an increase in the prison population. Um, and the reason being is because there are a number of people who are out on probation or parole who did a violation, usually substance related, and uh, that gets revoked and they get put in prison. So we have numbers climbing in our prisons. Uh, the women's facility in Lusk it's over capacity, the Rollins prison is near capacity, uh, we're shipping prisoners out of state, uh, and we're putting people in there that probably don't belong there. Okay, um, so how do you go about correcting that? And I know some of the prison stuff has been a hot topic in the past, uh, particularly Rollins with the, the rehab and, and trying to rebuild and, and whether they should build from scratch or, or put a bunch of money towards, uh, uh, I guess, uh, readjusting that building and, and, and kind of doing some fixes. So uh, what else is kind of popping up? Uh, and, and, and do we, is throwing money at the problem the best solution in your mind? Well, I mean, you, all of this is going to cost money. No matter right. What. But I think the more sensible and fiscally responsible way is to not put people in prison who don't pose a general danger to society. Um, what we've got to do is address the underlying substance abuse issues. The efficacy of that was proven a few years ago when the legislature withdrew funds for uh, in-house treatment of substance abusers and okay. had an um, almost immediate bump in the recidivism rate. Uh, funding was restored and was in commensurate decline again. And I think those issues are really important. You know, and I, you don't treat people with a substance abuse problem by sticking them in jail and costing the taxpayers an enormous amount. We're visiting with Charles Pelkey, one of our local state uh, house representatives here, and he's uh, recently elected the minority whip. Uh, I know you, you serve on a couple other committees. Anything else that's kind of big in the committees you serve on that's kind of popping up uh, with what you guys have been discussing uh, coming into the session? We've been looking at, at uh, the work of some state agencies on the management audit committee. And, okay. Uh, those studies are ongoing. It's been very interesting, though. It's, it's, it's nice to just take a step back and try to decide whether the expressed mission of an agency in the state is actually uh, being accomplished. Okay. And uh, you just do it by the numbers. We obviously are getting ready. We know that uh, there's a big budget crunch in this state. Uh, you know, from your perspective, I mean, you've served in the state house now for several years. Uh, what do you feel like has been maybe the most valuable piece that you've kind of learned through the years in just terms of trying to get some things accomplished in the, in the legislative session, whether it's a short session last year like a budget or a general session that's coming up this year that's so much longer? Well, I think the first thing is that you put, put aside party affiliation and just try to work with people who have a common view of uh, the way the state can and should progress. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've learned a long time ago that uh, the best way to do that is to get to know people as individuals mm -hmm. rather than somebody who represents a party. I'm a Democrat, obviously. There are not a lot of us. We would not get a thing accomplished if we, we just hunkered down and played partisan politics. But there are a number of people on the other side of the aisle that, uh, uh, you know, we agree on certain issues, disagree on certain issues, and when we agree, we get to work together, and it, it turns out pretty well, let me get your perspective on this, because I've, I've said this on the air before, and some people agree with me and some don't, but this is one of the states where the, 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 there's not quite the divisiveness that you see in other parts of the country when you know the two parties kind of clash in the legislature. I mean, obviously you mentioned there are things you agree on, things you disagree on, but it just does, it doesn't seem like here in Wyoming, it seems like I guess maybe we get along better than some other places in the country when it comes to Republican, Democrat, and having to work together. Well, you know, when I first got into the House, there, there are 
certain traditions where you start the day off, you know, you do the uh, uh, invocation from a uh, member of the clergy, you know, say the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we walk around and shake hands with each other for a good 10 minutes and say good morning and, and uh, you know, that's people you agree with and disagree with, but you, you know them as people, you know that they have families, they know, you know, they know your kids, mm -hmm. and uh, you treat them as human beings. And I, I thought at first that that was kind of a trite tradition, but I actually think it's really valuable. We're talking with Charles Belkey again here, Let Me Live on KOWB on a Friday, uh, right before the legislative session starts next Tuesday. Uh, I heard you, one of the bills that you're bringing to the floor is that marriage bill. Oh. Uh, talk a little bit about the background and, and why you're why you're proposing this bill here in, in terms of uh, you know making the age 18 before you can legally marry instead of letting some others younger with parental consent get married. Well, I mean, frankly, it's a decision that an adult should make, not an adult should make for someone else, but should make for themselves. Okay. And we have a pretty common delineation about the age of majority in, in this country, and that's 18. With some exceptions, alcohol can't be purchased until you're 21. But it's probably one of the um, easiest avenues for child exploitation is, is, is marrying minors. Uh, there are a number of organizations in the country, and frankly, it was because I had uh, reached out to one of those organizations that I learned a little bit more about it. Uh, we've had a number, um, a significant number, I think 1,200 uh, marriages involving parties under the age of 18. And I just frankly think that it's something that we, uh, um, we really need to look at. I introduced the bill to get the discussion going. I'm going to bring in some, some people to testify as to how that worked for them and, and what kind of problems they have. And minors getting married have a higher rate of divorce, they have a higher rate of poverty, they have a higher rate of exploitation, and I think, frankly, there shouldn't be exceptions to the marriage uh, until someone's mm -hmm. at the age of majority. Anything else that you're going to be bringing to the to the to the house floor this year that you're going to be introducing? Oh, I've got a couple of uh, of things. Uh, the uh, upon conviction of a felony, the court is required uh, to order a pre-sentence investigation. Okay. Um, those cost a lot of money. They take two to three months to complete. They put a lot of strain on probation and parole, and in some cases, they're not necessary. So what I'm doing is I'm going to introduce a bill that uh, will allow the court the discretion as to whether or not to order it. Because obviously in some cases it's not going to make any difference on the, on the ultimate sentence. I've got another bill uh, which I, <coughs> in homage to my friend uh, Tyler Lindholm, who passed the Land of Food Freedom Act uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago, which allows direct sales from uh, producers to consumers. I'm, Introducing a thing called the Wyoming Beer Freedom Act, which will allow, uh, <laughs> and I, it's, I, it's a total ripoff of the title, but I, I, I thought that what Tyler did with uh, direct sales was a good idea. And this would allow um, local brewers to actually sell at special events outside of their retail location. Right now, okay. the way the law reads, okay. uh, you know, if you went to Cold Creek Tap, for example, you could get a beer that they produce, but you cannot have them come and, and serve beer at a, a special event outside of the retail space. And I think it's something, you know, you'd still have to get a permit locally, but at least state law would will vary from doing that. Well, and, and that's kind of a, a little bit of a different growing industry in in, in, in the uh, in the state is, is some of the, the brewers across the state, some of the, even some of the distribution locations. That, that has been a growing sector, I think, here in Wyoming. Yeah, it's, it, it is all across the country. I mean, I, I remember when I turned uh, 18 or 19 here in Wyoming, and I could go out and get beer, it was always the large commercial producers. You know, but there were there were changes in the law that allowed and encouraged people to produce locally, and, mm -hmm. and some of that is just wonderful. And some of those are terrific products. And I'd like to see uh, that get out to the community a little bit more if people want. Okay. All right. Well, again, we're visiting with Representative uh, Charles Pelkey, the Minority Whip. Uh, do you like do you like being the minority whip? I know, <laughs> as you mentioned, there's not a lot of you yeah, in, well, I in tell the state you. house. But do you like that role? I, it's a nice role, and and you know, uh, I was minority whip 
during my last term. Right. Um, and they've got us somewhat segregated in the back of the room. So as a minority <laughs> whip, all I got to do is spin around in my chair and go, hey, well, let's talk about voting this way on that. And, uh, you know, I don't have to. Uh, Tyler now has been his majority whip, and so he's got a lot bigger group of people to keep him. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, other topics that folks that you represent have kind of brought to your attention that they want you to address. Uh, as you as you get out and hear from constituents that have voted for you, that re-elected you here in the in the most recent uh, uh, election back in November, are there other topics that you know people said, "Hey, I want you to kind of look at this for me," or, or what are uh, I mean, what's what's kind of popping up in in your constituents? Well, when I was knocking doors during the uh, campaign, uh, education is still on the forefront. And, um, you know, there is a really strong alliance of, of Democrats and a large core of Republicans that are really committed to protecting the quality of education in Wyoming. By some standards, Wyoming ranks the highest quality K-12 program uh, west of the Mississippi, ranking only fourth nationally behind Massachusetts, Vermont, and New Hampshire, and I don't want to lose that. I mean, that's the way you attract new families, new businesses to the state. We have to uh, maintain the quality of education. Um, one of the reasons that uh, we felt so good about moving back here, I'd been gone in Colorado working for a magazine and wanted to come back here, uh, was it 15 years ago? Uh, <laughs> was the quality of education. Both right. my kids went to the UW lab school and then to in high school, and they got a terrific education. And I don't think we should deny that to people. I sure as heck wouldn't move to a state with an education system and quality of, say, Mississippi, uh, because those kids don't have as much opportunity afterwards. Um, that's a big one. That's an absolutely big one. Well, there's always the talk about the education budget and the funding with education. So where where do you stand on that? Where where do you feel we need to look at in terms of, because obviously the state's still in a budget crunch. Uh, there have been cuts to education for a couple years, and last year was kind of saved where it looked like there was going to possibly be a big cut. So where are we at in your mind in terms of what or how we continue to fund it but not take away from some other places that still need it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I'm really committed to this year is, is fiscal transparency. We have a huge number of separate accounts here, there, and everywhere. Uh, and every once in a while, uh, well, my first term, we, we had to fund something to the tune of $30 million or $28 million. Okay. And I asked where the money's coming from. I said, oh, that'll be coming out of the uh, reserve fund for the Buffalo Bill Man. had nothing to do with dams that we were funding. But, okay. you know, and so the joke is, is they're referring to them as coffee cans. We've got a lot of coffee cans. Okay. Uh, there are organizations that assess the quality of the fiscal health of particular states, and we are in solid ground in this state. Um, but we're the only state that that organization doesn't doesn't audit because we're not really transparent about where all the money is. I want to get that clarified, and then we've got to look at, at alternatives to revenue. Um, we don't have a, uh, a corporate income tax, we don't have an individual income tax. Uh, corporate income tax in particular may be something that we have to look at. Mm -hmm. Take for example, if we were to take, bring a high-tech company in Laramie with 10,000 employees and there was no revenue associated with that, the cost of the state would be immense. We wouldn't actually benefit from that inclusion in that company because we'd have to pay for the infrastructure, we'd have to pay to educate their children. Wow. Um, we have to look at revenue alternatives. The problem we have right now, though, is that we have a number of legislators who come to the, come to the uh, session having already signed a new taxes pledge, not even an adjustment in taxes. So we're kind of handcuffed with that. Fortunately, none of the Albany County delegations ever signed. Well, and are you surprised by that? I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't think you want to pay higher taxes. Nobody likes to pay higher taxes. Let's just put it that way. No. I, I mean, but are you? <clears throat> are, have you been surprised that there hasn't even been some discussion? I mean, last year, it didn't even make it to the session, basically. No. I mean, the year before, it pretty much got shot down in the session, but it didn't even make it there last session. Are you surprised by that at all, Charles? Um, no, I'm not. I, I, I'm disappointed. Okay. Um, because, I mean, taxes... Nobody likes paying taxes, but we also benefit from, from 
the fact that we as a community come together to fund things. Take a look at our high school. Yeah. You know, we as a community voted to tax ourselves to enhance the state funding mm -hmm. of, of that beautiful new high school that we've got. Um, and, you know, that's a decision that we make. I want to give local communities the ability to, to raise their own taxes if they want. Right now, their communities are under a limitation of what they can impose in taxes. But if a community comes together and decides, we've got a project that we want to support, okay. um, we should be able to do that. So I, I want to allow communities to tax themselves, and we need to look at our revenue stream because you know, coal is down significantly, and that is ultimately what made us as wealthy as we are, but it's not going to last forever. Right, and that brings me to my next question. Diversifying the economy is such a big topic of discussion, and everybody talks about, you know, we need to go different directions. Are there certain areas you feel like the state of Wyoming needs to focus on to better diversify the economy? Because I hear a lot of talk, but I don't hear a lot of solutions, perhaps, that uh, kind of come to the forefront. Well, you may recall I was a, a journalist 25, 30 years ago covering the state legislature. Uh, and uh, we were talking economic diversification then, too. Right. There are certain things that we have to do, establish infrastructure, uh, make sure that we have uh, transportation, including air service around the state. We've taken steps in that direction. But again, we have to look at the revenue picture. It'll do us no good to attract a business with 10,000 employees if it's ultimately going to cost the tax the other taxpayers in Wyoming right. to support the infrastructure and education. Well, and I was visiting with Senator Office, and one of the things he uh, is big on is blockchain. Not not talking about necessarily Bitcoin and some of the cryptocurrencies, but blockchain, but getting things set up. So uh, much like you hear about some of the credit card companies that, that incorporate back in the state of Delaware, but getting that kind of corporate structure, as you say, set up from a government standpoint so that if these companies do want to establish their blockchain companies here in Wyoming, that we benefit from them. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Senator Rothfuss and, and again, uh, Tyler and Lindholm were instrumental in passing the bills that we had last year. Um, it's um, it's interesting. You know, I, I thought it was funny, though, last year, just a, a side observation. We spent, we, we moved five major bills through on blockchain, and we became one of the uh, early adopters in the country. Right. Um, but I would still hear in the background, what the heck are we voting on? You know, from people, because right? and then, so we passed these bills out of the House, we uh, passed them out of the Senate, the governor signs them, and then, and only then, on the last day of the session, <laughs> do we get a, a an hour long seminar on what the heck this stuff is, you know, uh, what right. blockchain is. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm absolutely impressed with with the work they've done, and we've got a we've got a working group, and I think there's a better understanding and then, frankly I think what we did was a really good uh, first step and I think that may produce some uh, uh, new jobs in Wyoming and so forth. Uh, businesses were already setting up as soon as the loan. That's, that's good to hear, good to hear. Well I'm up against the, the end of the hour here but I greatly appreciate your time this morning and, and no problem in adjusting the schedule and oh, I appreciate have it. fun in the session starting Tuesday. Uh, I'll be there for two months. <laughs>